out here. All right, welcome everybody to the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show. Big show tonight, stay tuned. Big, big show tonight. We are brought to you by Michelin Tires. That's right, Michelin Tires. And we're brought to you by Butcher Barbecue and all the great products from David Bosca and the Butcher Barbecue family rubs grilling butters injections more injections more rubs and of course we're brought to you by the green mountain grill available now at the owl's nest barbecue supply store in ultawa easy cooking over real wood the green mountain grill smoker Available at the Owl's Nest Supply Store in Ottawa. I got a big surprise for our next guest going to be coming up. Don't forget, everybody, we're brought to you our, by our broadcast partner as well. Backyard Smokers Barbecue right here on Facebook. A great place to get all kinds of information about... Cooking, live fire cooking, charcoal, grills, pits, anything. If you got a question, if you especially if you just start now, there's like a hundred thousand members on this Facebook page. And if you're just starting out, all you gotta do is go to there and ask a question and Wes will answer. Somebody like me might answer. Anybody, any, anybody with a little expertise will be there for you. The Backyard Smokers Barbecue Facebook page. And back home, my, um Monitoring the chat, I think, is my buddy Jeff Maxwell. Jeff works for Home Depot, and he has to make sales calls. And sometimes he gets them late, and sometimes he can't get back. But he'll be there. And if not, just talk to each other. That's all you got to do. Just talk to each other in the chat room. Have a good time. Are you our special guest tonight? All the way from Sperry, Oklahoma. Folks, this fella is a genuine American barbecue icon and we're so excited to have him on the name of his team is buffalo's barbecue from sperry oklahoma population 305 on weekends of comps is 304 or 1304 up until 1907 it was known as bueller switch our guest has been cooking since 1996 he has won the jack daniels invitational he has won the american royal and he has been a KCBS team of the year. And you know what else we have in common, Donnie Teal? What's that? We are both John Prine fans. Yes, I like John Prine. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. You know, you know, David always starts his uh, podcast off with where are you right now? And I do mine a little different. I start mine off with, if you could be anywhere else right now, where would you be? Mm, sitting at the local establishment, having some ice water and maybe a cold beer. <laughs> I like that. I like that. What is the local establishment in Sperry, Oklahoma? Uh, not in Sperry. We have to go... Just uh, east of here, about 10 miles to Owasa, and we like hanging out over at PJ's in Owasa. Well, that sounds good. I'm going to do something else for you right now. Now, you, you've got to, you're going to have to make good on your promise to David Boskin in his interview with you. I think you can hear that, can't you? Uh, barely, yes. How about that? Yeah. Now you said you would sing that if you heard it, and not dance to it. Yeah, I, I've done <laughs> that at the Royal. Like there there were a, a few things involved. But, uh, yeah, I, that's one of my favorite songs. We call it the wedding song over here in Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I tell you, that was a. Uh, I was, uh, you know, sometimes when you uh, 
when you connect with somebody, there's a reason that you connect with somebody. And when I heard your interview with David, I said, well, that's, that's the reason that, uh, I like him so much already. He's a John Prine fan. <laughs> just, just like yeah. me, just like me for years and years and years. Donnie Teal from Sperry, Oklahoma. Donnie, I've got, I was trying to make you feel at home tonight. So I've got a picture on, uh, behind me of your barbecue stand over in front of the, um, I think it's the, uh, what is it, Daylight Donuts in Sperry, Oklahoma? Yes, sir. I've got a, I've got a picture of your stand there. So um, you'll feel right at home, and the people back, people watching can kind of get a feel for your uh, your establishment there in Sperry. But, the, you know, the establishment started, gosh, I guess, what, t- almost 25, 26 years ago when you started in competition barbecue uh, go over how did how did Donnie Teal, the electrician, s- installing switches and um, fixtures in homes, get to be Donnie Teal Buffalo Barbecue and major barbecue championship winner? Oh, it, uh, the electrical business kind of was going south, and I've always wanted to open a restaurant. And- the name Buffalo come from when I worked in the oil field, a bunch of guys just called me Buffalo. And so when we got ready to start cooking, we uh, asked the wife and she said, well, let's just use Buffalo. So we called it Buffalo's barbecue. And we just kept the name when we opened the, the concession trailer here in town. Mm-hmm. Cause I guess everybody knew yeah. you in a small town like Sperry, Oklahoma, I guess everybody, uh, I guess once you get a nickname, you you keep that nickname for life, don't you? It's kind of like here in the little town I live in, in Ottawa. Yeah, I, I, see, I grew up out in western Oklahoma, and, but my family's from Sperry, and there's been pretty much a Sperry kid in, or a Till kid in Sperry school since uh, probably around the 40s, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. pretty much nonstop. We're one of the largest families in town, us and another family called Juby's. And, uh, but so all of my cousins all went to school in Sperry and my aunts and uncles and so on and so forth. I I never went to Sperry school myself, but, uh, there's always been a lot of teals in Sperry school or relatives or, you know, close cousins. So Donnie, when I think of Oklahoma, especially years and years ago, I think of driving, driving to Oklahoma and seeing, um, oil wells just pumping in random places uh is it is it it like that still uh yeah the eastern part eastern and part of the central is there's a lot of pump jacks and stuff Mm -hmm. because there's not enough pressure to get the stuff out of the ground so they use pump jacks to get stuff up you get out western oklahoma that's where the high pressure wells are and they got enough pressure they don't have to have pump jacks, and that's where the gas and and oil come from. You know, from the high pressure stuff out west. Well, now, now, how old were you when you were working in oil fields? Uh, my dad run a trucking outfit in western Oklahoma, and I worked there all the pretty much all the way through high school and until december 1st 1986 and i got laid off from enron Mm -hmm. and i was just you know about six six or eight months after i got married (laughs) so so you had to find something else to do huh well i guess if you got a laid off from enron it's better than going to jail like a lot of them did (laughs) yeah with the, with uh, the collapse of enron I left there and then went to work for Dowell Slumberjay and uh, worked there for quite a few years and just got tired of coming home and my daughter not knowing who I was. And and so I gave my notice and quit and we moved up to Tulsa and didn't have a job. And I'd find something to do. I'd drive a truck and have mm-hmm. a CDL. And I know I'd find a job doing something. So... We packed up and moved about four hours east. Wow, just uh, just up and left, and without a without a job to uh, go to, but you found one. And uh, oh yeah, it, it was good because 
ain't nothing worse coming home and seeing your daughter and she's scared of you because she, she don't know who you are because you're never home. And my dad worked in the oil field and I thought I ain't going to raise my kid like that. I just, I want to be around to enjoy things with her as she grew up. So I guess, what is it? Just, is it just long hours that you, that they put in on those fields? Yeah. Well, you know, back then it wasn't nothing to work 80 to a hundred hours a week. Oh my and, gosh. And you know, sometimes you wouldn't get your days off sometimes you would and, mm-hmm. you know what are, a lot so. donnie what do, what do they do i mean what do you have to do in an oil well i've got know nothing about you know it's it's ironic i've owned a service station and sold gasoline for 36 years i don't know anything about <laughs> how it comes out of the ground what do you what do you have to what does a person have to do when they're working in, a, in an oh, oil field like what did you uh, do well, for Dowell, it was a service company, and we did cementing, which would be on the drilling part of it. Mm-hmm. And then we have a, a stimulation crew, a frack crew that would come in on the completion side of it. And I mainly worked on the completion side, run pump trucks and blenders, and then a continuous use mixer, and ended up in the computer van you know putting in the current downhole pressures and stuff that the engineers would give you and mm-hmm. stuff like that so it uh but you'd go in and frack a well and you'd, you'd pump a, a gel down it a slick gel and then you'd pump sand or bauxite or something in behind it depending on the downhole pressures to, of which you'd have to use and that would create a fracture and that sand would go in there and crack that open further and then that would get the gas and stuff to, mm-hmm. to come out so and when it when it comes out of the ground where does where does where's the tank or the barrel where does it sit that it goes into because i you know i always see those big pumpers those those uh jacks going up and down up and down up and down but I know the oil's got to come out of the ground somewhere, but where does it go when it, how does it, is there a, 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 like a, a, a lot of them are tied into these other wells are tied in, everything's tied in tank batteries and separators and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, but it'll go, you know, after a frack job, they'll put a frack tank out there and I lay this flow back iron out there, which is really, really thick stuff and heavy and, It'll uh, it'll go in there, and, and you'd you know you'll have a flow back hand out there, and he'll check and every hour and see how much you're getting back, and but eventually when it gets on the production side, it'll it'll go into tank batteries, and then you got pumpers that come around and they'll check the water, how much water it's producing a day, and how much oil and. You, know, you go to the gas meter house and see how much gas it's produced and so well no wonder it's 18 to 20 hours a day because it sounds like there's a whole lot to do during the day oh yeah getting that stuff clean out of the ground. everybody's it's like you building a cake every you know everything's got its you know you got to start out with the flour and stuff like that mm-hmm. so know, and then add, add to your ingredients and then guy comes in on the backside and may frost the cake and that's kind of what we did is you know on the on the frack crew side of it mm-hmm. so you've been so you were working in the wells <laughs> moved to tulsa drove a truck became an electrician and then you learned about something called barbecue i worked at a meat plant for a few years too and or we processed a custom beef plant and sold retail and Oh my goodness! I, uh, so I cut meat for a while, and when I what? went there, I did all the hams and turkeys and bacon and made sausages, and plus helped cut up beef and hogs and sheep and deer during deer season. So, so, so you kind were, of a jack of all trades. So you were like the uh, David Bosco of Sperry, Oklahoma. Oh yeah, I work over at Claremore for a place called Walkie Brothers Meats, mm-hmm. and uh, but it's it was a good learning experience. You know, I mean, I'd been around some of it as a kid, 
you know, deer hunting, but, you know, nothing on that scale of doing beef and hogs and, you know, so, do six, 600 deer in a week of gun season and it's just crazy. So was it there you got your interest in barbecue? Well, yeah, kind of. Um, I always did it before. I mean, what was the moment? I'm looking, before. I'm looking for that moment. I'm looking for the, you know, the, the light bulb goes off in your head and, and you turn to your wife, Cindy, and said, we can do this. What What is that moment? Well, I, I had some friends that lived here in Sperry too. And he owned a restaurant in Skytook. His name was Mike McMillan of Max Barbecue. And Mike was one of the early guys in the 80, you know, late eighties and early nineties. And Mike and Vicky go around and, all their kids and their two girls and go to contest and and I always wondered. I thought, man, how's he know about where all these contests are and so on and so forth. And so I caught him one day down at the local store and I asked him. I said, hey, how do you how do you know where to go and you know mm-hmm. what town these things are in? And so he told me how to become a member of KCBS and you know you'd, you'd get a little paper and we call it the bull sheet. And, mm-hmm. You know, and that little paper turned into a bigger paper and so on and so forth. But And so I kind of got started like that, and I started got my cousins. We built a homemade offset cooker, and we kind of just started there and going to contest. And, you know, we did one contest in 95, and, and then we kind of started in KCBS in 96, and just kind of went from there. Now, KCBS, we, uh, I guess we, in, in 96 was kind of, I wouldn't say it's in its, it wasn't in its infancy, but it was certainly, I'm sure, different than it is now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, things were a lot different. I mean, there was a lot more tents, a lot less motorhomes, uh, toy haulers. I mean, it was more of a tent deal. You, you go put up a tent. An easy up. A lot of people back then had these pipe tents that you put together and yep. put the gray tarps across the top. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's how we started. And, you know, I go to my first cook off and we whip in there and, you know, and you see all these people you read about in the bull sheet and you're looking around and you think, man, I just don't want to come in last. You know, <laughs> that's my whole, whole objective is not to to come in dead last and you know i think there was like 30 some teams there and we finished something right in the middle of the pack of 16 to 18 you know and i thought you know this ain't bad we didn't get no calls or nothing but you know i thought you know yeah. I, we, we 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 could do okay and we went to their second cook off and we get three calls bomb chicken or we'd won the whole deal you know and wow and so and you, it's your it, second cook off yeah and, you know we got a first place rib and we got a call on pork and a call on brisket and didn't get no chicken call. And, and I thought, man, we're really hooked now. You know, they called our name and I just stood there and the wife elbows me and goes, hey, that's us. <laughs> you know, go up there and get your award. And so, but, you know, it's met a lot of great people over the years. And, and you know, a lot of people always said, uh, uh, I think Mike Davis used to say, he goes, it's like a big family reunion, but you get to pick your family. And yeah. That's kind of what it is. You know, Donnie, you're one of those guys that connect the old with the uh, new. And um, what was um, what was a contest? What was the timetable of a KCBS contest back in 1995 and 96? Um, was it like it was today where everybody came in Friday nights? Or what was it like? Yeah, you know, not everybody shows up at Thursday evening or early Friday morning. And back then it was more three or four or five and six in the evening, you know, mm-hmm. and show up and set up. And because back then all the cooks meetings were pretty much eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but people come in and I mean, just pretty much the same other and people don't get there as early as they do nowadays. And, of course, entry fees were a lot cheaper, but, you know, the prize money wasn't near as much as, you know, it is nowadays either. And it was a lot cheaper to cook because back then most people were, you know, if you was 
cooking a choice brisket or a prime brisket, you were cutting a fat hog in the butt. And, you know, mo- you know, most time they just go to the store and find what you know, find what you can find. And you know, I got second in a chest to chest cook off in Great Bend, Kansas, with a twenty pound slack. Uh-huh. In second place, you know, and talk about talk about chicken a little bit. Inject like you do nowadays. It was more of a rub and go type deal. And talk about chicken because I know I was listening to an interview with Ray Lampy one time, and I know you know Ray. And he said yeah. one of his first, um, I think he said his first win at a barbecue contest was in Turkey. Now, could you cook? Yeah. And I guess. Back then, could you, you could cook turkey as as in was it a poultry division? I, I've heard stories about that. That was before me. Uh-huh. Uh huh. When I started, it was you know chicken or Cornish game hens. Mm-hmm. Back was my first you know deal with it, but they had other categories and stuff. And uh, but pretty much you know all. Back in the 90s, you know, it was still kind of a thigh deal, but the breast was more of a thing. Trying mm-hmm. to do, everybody was trying to do breast. I know one team to, to this day, the only time he's ever cooked dark meat is when he has to go to the jack. The rest of the time he cooks breast. And, now, and they're very good at it, but it's just, you know, that breast deal is a whole different dog trying to keep it moist and not dry out. Yeah, because that's. Uh... I know, I know, I can't do it. What it was? Um, do they? Did you cook chicken thighs then, like they're cooked now in the, in the butter? Is that is that something that's been with us a long time, or did you do it differently? Uh, I I probably been doing it since ninety eight in the butter. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I had my Oklahoma Joe, I had a what I called a choke when it was just a door at the back at the firebox. The my cooker was set up for convection tube. I didn't like that convection tube because it's just real dirty smoke. I never could. And you'd have to build a fire to burn down the forest to get it hot enough. And so I pulled the tube out of mine and just had a hole. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I could, I cooked chicken back then, just a hair over thirty minutes from start to finish. Well, that's and, pretty I mean, quick. That butter sounded like pop. That butter sounded like popcorn <laughs> back there, and I'm back. It was, it was, it was getting after it. Okay, now but let's let's morph let's morph from the first turn in protein chicken to the uh, last brisket, and I want to know. And everybody, this is this is no joke. I want to hear the method. For the two hour and fifty minute brisket, start to finish. Yeah, that was about two fifty eight. I mean, it was right under three hours. Uh, back in, I, all I do is pull the kernel off the side, and they wasn't big briskets. I ain't saying them, you know they were like twelve pounders, mm-hmm. packers, and just pull the kernel off the side, and, and I'd put it on, and I'd go an hour and a half and wrap it, and then hour and a half, you know, just a hair under an hour and a half in the fall, and she was done. So what what temperature yeah. did you wrap it at, at after an hour and a half? I, don't, I always went off color. I okay. Color, I'm a color guy instead of poking it. Okay. Uh, so when you wrapped it, did you put I, anything I, I, with, in it? Any broth or anything? Yeah, yeah. I always put a little broth or something in there. Back then, the big thing was board light. Mm-hmm. You know, we put Bordelais in the foal, and yeah. and uh, we got this Bordelais out of California, and a lot of people know it today as Head Country Marinade. I don't know if it's act. I, I don't think it's an actual recipe. I'm not positive, but I think they've tried to knock it off. I don't know if they actually bought the recipe. I don't know all the details on that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, it. I'd, I'd run my Joe at, at 300, but depending on how I'd run that choke is I could set stuff in the back and cool my front off and or I'd close the choke and equal the temperature out in my pit. And so that choke and me were very good friends because I learned how to use that choke and well, would get things rocking and rolling pretty good. Because that, that's incredible. I've never heard of, I've never heard of anybody 
cooking a, a brisket. Was that your regular method? I mean, contest after contest was. Yeah, I did that for a long time, but my brisket scores were always good, but my pork couldn't stand the heat. Mm-hmm. And I'd always bomb on pork, so I so I kind of slowed down the brisket where I could eat, be more even across the board on my scores because I don't know how many times a pork had knocked me out of a grand or a reserve. And I, you know, and I, so I just slowed it down and tried to keep, keep my brisket the same. My brisket scores would fall off a little bit, but I'd still place a little bit. And my mm-hmm. pork scores came up and which equal walking to the stage at the end <laughs> instead of three or four holes before that. So yeah. That was what it was about. A two hour and 58 minute brisket. You think you could still do it today? Oh, yeah. No, no problem. problem. <laughs> I, it's a little be harder on the jambo, but I mean, if I still had that Joe, I mean, that Joe, we, we went a lot of miles together and, and, and uh, won a lot of contests. And I've done well with the jambo, too. But And of course, your buddy. I like, pain, I like my pain a little better on my jambo than I do my Joe. I can imagine. Time. Of course, your, your buddy Joe Davison just elected to the Barbecue Hall of Fame, and that's a yep. uh, that's a that's a huge that's a deal. deal. Yeah, that's a huge deal. But there's a lot of rules in the in uh, for KCBS uh, are rules because of Joe. So, like what? Uh, quiet time is one of them. <laughs> Tell me that story. <laughs> uh, Joe was notorious for very loud radio uh-huh. speakers and he was one of them and it was late at night and you'd ask him to turn it down he'd just turn it up <laughs> so yeah Joe there's some of them rules in there for Joe there's some, Joe rules somebody was somebody was talking about him in an interview I heard about um, Joe Davidson and I think it was Ray Lampy said when he came that you knew where the party was going to be that night uh, yeah, yeah. It? No, it's still that way today. He, he's a little slower, but he still gets her done. So, yeah, Joe, he he liked to he liked to party. Well, there's a, there's a lot of them that like the party. I know. What um the um you you were you were on the uh, KCBS board of directors, I think, from what 2000 to 2004. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What um what changes? But to me, I think I think a lot of things changed in the early two thousands. Of course, I was not even aware that there was such a thing as a barbecue contest back then. But what what things changed while you were on the board? What did you maybe implement, or what did you push, or what did you vote for by your fellow board members that y'all tried to change some things? Uh, one of the one of the things was on the rules deal that I was real adamant about and it got changed was the no tolerance for turning times. Uh, we had a, two or three teams here around Tulsa that would, you know, used to it was the rep would say, if I stand out there by the table and I look down the aisle and I can see you coming, we'll take your box. Mm-hmm. Well, it was always the same teams they were waiting on in yeah. every category, every weekend. And I thought, this is bull. Yeah, uh, ain't right. You, you, you've got to have, you got to stay by your times, and you got to be punctual and be there when you need to be there, and not just dragging up two or three minutes late. And everybody that was on time, all their food sitting there getting cool, while theirs is still hot. Yeah, it's not twelve thirty-five ish. Is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it just was the same same group in this area anyway. It mm-hmm. was the same group, two or three teams that were always just dragging, always on the back end. And, and that was one thing we got. You know, I went to the rules meeting at Lenexa and brung it up, and we got that changed. Uh, we changed the thing when we was on the board, and it wasn't very popular at the time. And it still ain't probably with a lot of people. Was we changed them from because back then they started at nine and they had to find something to judge down. Mm-hmm. So we put a deal in where they had 
to start at a six and go up or down from a six. Well, then everybody said, well, KCBS is broke, don't want to buy any more 180 pins and yada, yada, yada. And, and so we went through that. And so y'all were trying to, like, so y'all were trying to dictate the way the scores were, were, were or the judges were trained. Yeah. I mean, it was because back then it was a nine, eight and a nine, eight system. And we had umpteen million ties. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and back then the place, you know, a lot of contests only paid five places. Well, you have a six or seven way tie. You got two people are leaving there has the same score as first place, but they didn't leave with any money or a trophy. Yeah. You know, and the, the ties just got way. I mean, when you're having ties for grand and reserve and, and it's just, and you know, people are getting knocked at, you know, where the money's a lot bigger. I mean, the complaints coming into the board were just crazy. You know, people want, you know, and so that's what we did with, you know, and you can't please everybody. We, at the time we thought that was the way to go and that's what we did. And we got some back. I mean, <clears throat> I don't care what you do. You're going to get backlash because mm-hmm. you can't please everybody. So that's just part of the game of saying you want to be on the board. Well, it's, it's, it's good that you served on the board. And, um, I think if everybody took a turn on the board, it'd have a lot different, uh, a view of what goes on behind the scenes at a barbecue yeah, contest. I mean, it's, it's a lot. I mean, there's a lot that goes on that people don't. Oh yeah. You know, they just take for granted. And mm-hmm. it's, there's a lot more to it. You know, there ain't nobody there. I don't think to just want to flip it upside down, but. I mean, everybody's got, you know, with that many board members, you got lots of different opinions. So, all right, Donnie, now, now we're, 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 we're cooking contest. I guess you're staying mostly where Oklahoma, a little bit of Texas, Missouri, maybe around in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Our, I mean, well, back then we cooked Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri. A uh, few in Texas, cooked some IBCAs, cooked mm-hmm. a lot of non-sanctioned stuff around Tulsa. Uh, uh, that was about it for several years, just mainly them them areas. Yeah. Okay. Now let's roll. You're, you're cooking, you're cooking, you're cooking. Then all of a sudden, around 2008, 2009, 2010, this guy named John Marcus comes along and he taps – Ray Lampy on the shoulder. He taps Myron Mixon. Uh, he's he's tapping people, and he's doing. He's got Chris Lilly in his stable, and he's doing these uh, barbecue all star series that don't do that great. But he comes back with another another series of barbecue competitions, and and then all of a sudden, bam, uh, uh, barbecue pitmasters debuts. And all of a sudden, the rush of people into the barbecue sport is enormous. Tell me how that affected you, and tell me how you dealt with that as a competitor. I thought it was great. I mean, anytime you can get barbecue on TV, it's it's only good for everybody involved. So, I mean, John did a great job of, of elevating if you want to call it a sport or whatever you want to call it, elevating it to, you know, to the mass memberships, Mm -hmm. more people involved. I mean, the TV deal is, I mean, it's just crazy how it exploded and people got into the barbecue scene and a lot of people's, you know, made it their life now too. So, you know, so that's all good. Yeah, but did you see? Did you see a, an increase when you went to contest? Were you amazed at the new faces you were seeing, the new, the new rigs that you were seeing, and all of a sudden the uh, the wagyu briskets? Tell me, tell me about when the wagyu brisket showed up on the scene. Well, I was probably one of the later ones to ever try them. Just I was always too tight to buy them. So, mm-hmm. but when you start getting beat by them every weekend, it's either 
join the kids on the playground or stand over in the corner and I got tired of getting whipped on so it was time to get on the playground with the rest of them uh it was you know a lot of new a lot of new things when I first got into barbecue what I really liked about it and I, I mean I still like it mm-hmm. back then it was it ain't the guy that drove the big fancy bus i mean we had a few people that did back then it it didn't matter what you cooked on as long as you knew how it cooked Mm -hmm. and all i said i like is because it don't matter where you come from what you do how much money you got you can still compete you know and there's a there's a story about this i went to a cook-off in springfield missouri one year and uh, there's a guy a lot of people know. His name's Snell. He's an old man, wears bib overalls, kind of got the ZZ top beard, you know, hangs down. Mm-hmm. And I was across the aisle from Snell. <laughs> and there's two or three of these young guys come walking by. You know, probably 25 at the most, 26. And they're chuckling and laughing at Snell. It made me mad, and uh, they were I just. Told them boys, I, said, I said, "Don't be laughing." He goes, "Well, look at this guy's old rusty barrels he's cooking on these cans. Look like trash cans." Uh-huh. I said, "You won't be laughing on Saturday. Yeah. That old man's gonna whip your butt." <laughs> and uh, you know they they yeah yeah me and I said, "Don't ever laugh at what somebody's cooking on uh-huh. or what they got or don't got." I says, everybody's cooking, I'll speak for themselves. So we go to the wards the next day, and these three young guys, they never even got out of their chair, and Snell walks three times. I think Snell ended up third or fourth overall. And uh, so after the contest, I walked by, and I said, and they go, you was right. And I said, yep. Yep. I said, that old man knows how to cook. I said, don't laugh at him just because he's got rusty cans or something. I said, that old man's been around a long time, and he knows what he's doing. Yeah, the, the judges have no idea what you cook on. That's a fact. You know, the, 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 cooks don't, the cooks don't judge the food. The judges judge the food. And there's a, you know, it, it amazes me, even, even today when you go to a comp, there's, there's still a, a good cross-section of people that are um, – you know, they still cook in tents. Uh, they, they're bringing their, um, you know, the small offsets, uh, you know, like a beginner series. But um, I like right. to, I love seeing those guys out there because I was, you know, just seven short years ago, I was that guy. We had a, we, my, my friend and I, we bought a, um, we went and bought a uh, offset that, um, I mean, it leaked like the Exxon Valdez. It wouldn't, you couldn't get it up to, 250 degrees if you had to unless you burnt the forest down inside of it and uh, i mean it was tough it was tough cooking on that thing and uh, you know that was in the days when we were putting our pork butts and briskets on at 11 at night hoping they'd be ready by you know by by turning the next day and uh yep. and you know we just but we we went to the competitions and of course with the help of on online instruction now you can uh, you can get such a um, a lesson in barbecue, gosh, for free, just by going on to the uh, the different sites that there are, and uh, but but it wasn't like that when you came up, uh, Donnie. Where did you where did you gather your information at? School of hard knocks, pretty much. Is eat a lot of mistakes. And yeah. Bring some bourbon. Sit around <laughs> Friday night and and give them overcooked some bourbon and hopefully their lips would get loose a little bit and kind of remember some stuff and weed out the BS and, and, you know, try, try to implement it here and there and see if it worked. I mean, that's because there wasn't a lot of classes, you know, the, the barbecue forum wasn't going yet hardly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, the, the old bourbon and sat around and talk, you know, late at night and set up with them guys and hopefully you get something you could try or go with or you know somebody leaves something sitting out 
Donnie, when you were when you were starting, who was who would you consider the uh, the, the the superstar? Um, like uh, like nowadays, it's uh, Travis Clark, Darren Worth, Tim Shear, those guys. They're the uh, they're the the best cooks on the planet right now, as far as competition. When you started, who were the who were the rock stars of barbecue? Other than Donnie Teal, uh, when, when he got when he when he got enough information. Well, you had back then. You had to get around smoking in the boys' room. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard and Lynn Council, uh, Ted and Donna with PDT. Bart Clark, back then it was Double C and ended up being Twin Oaks. Uh, Paul Shoddy with Head Country. Mm-hmm. Danny Head with Head Country. Joe Davidson. Mike McMillan with Max. Uh, and then you had Jeff and Joy with Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the other guy. Scrutchfield out of Kansas City. I mean, all them guys were... Meatheads were good. Beer bait and barbecue. I mean, it was just, you know, and if you go down south, go to Texas, you know, you had Jerry King, Trigg. Uh, back then, Old Farts, uh, Bill Myers, a bunch of them guys down there, Bo Hunk, Jamie Gear. I mean, it was just, you know, Things ain't changed none. It's just the groups changed. Yeah, you know, and it's you know, every everybody has their time on the surf until the the surf starts running out. You know, you know the the first so time you ride as long as you can. Nah, it won't last forever. Absolutely. First time I heard of you was on Barbecue Pitmasters when they were doing a one of those quick um, interviews with um, Jamie Gear. I think he was, it was in the. The New York, I think the uh, New York State of Q episode, where he started naming the people that cook on Jambo Pits, and I think he mentioned you second. And um, of course, my my interest in in barbecue pit masters is, is well known, and uh, you know I, I scrambled around to find out who Donnie Teal was, did a little research, and found out who you were years ago. And um, what was it when you when you heard Jamie? mention you on that show because anytime in those days when they was under the first run if anybody was mentioned they became they became barbecue famous did did people reach out to you and want to know about your jambo and how did you get that jambo when you after you've been cooking on a uh, oklahoma joe well uh the reaching out yeah kind of i mean you know, I had to do the little film shoot and send pictures in where they could put it on Pitmasters. Mm-hmm. And Jamie had got a hold of me, and then the producer of the show got a hold of me. And uh, But the Jambo, how I ended up with the Jambo is kind of a long story. Uh, Jamie was always af- after me, hey, you need to cook on one of my pits. One of, you know, every time I'd see him, you need to cook on one of my pits. Uh, you know, I don't know. I just didn't have the money. And, uh, you know, they were a lot cheaper back then than they are now. And uh, so I started saving money, and I was going to get me one. And so I called Jamie. I said, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I ain't going to build no more pits. I'm bass fishing. And anybody knows Jamie very well. Back then, he'd jump from... One thing, he'd go bass fishing, then he'd build a pit or two, or he'd bass fish and not build any pits, and then he'd build a few here. Then he'd get rid of bass fishing, and he'd start building pits again. Mm-hmm. So, well, he said he ain't going to build no pits, he was bass fishing. So I got with uh, Roger Davidson, Joe Davidson's brother, which owns Horizon, and told him what I wanted to refurbish my pit, and i take it over there to get sandblasted, I told him I want to pick this trailer up raw, and I hooked it back over here to Sperry with it before it got wet and drew any moisture and had a paint guy ready to go, and he Mm -hmm. started putting primer on it. Anyway, I put a candy mandarin paint job on it and took the fenders down, had them chromed, and put them on, and then took the trailer back over, and Roger and them mounted the 
Joe back on and mm-hmm. he put me a new firebox on because mine was getting thin and get it all done and dolled out, put lights underneath, and all you know, all kinds of stuff, and all stainless stuff here on tables and stainless steel fish cooker to heat up water, you know, all this stuff. I get it back and I had it back maybe a month. Jamie calls me, Bonnie, I'm ready to build pit. I ain't got no money now. <laughs> I spent all my money. <laughs> so I was teaching a barbecue class, and the uh, guy asked me, he goes, I'd like to buy your pit. And I kind of thought to myself, I thought, do I really want to sell that? Because, I, I mean, I was on a roll. I was winning a ton. And I thought, this would be my way to get a Jambo. And I spouted out a price. I thought the guy would run backwards. Mm-hmm. You could buy a brand new one for less. You know, but I had a lot in it. I mean, I had a nice paint job. Yeah. And chrome, you know. And next words out of his mouth was, who do I make the check to? And I thought, dang, did I underprice it, you know? <laughs> and, uh. I took like 200 bucks out of my pocket and bought me a Jambo. That's how much I sold that pit for. Now, you still and, uh, you still cook on a Jambo? <laughs> yep, same Jambo, that I, my first Jambo that I bought. The same, same one. one. Just, it's on a second color now, but mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I, I sold that, and I told the guy, I said, I got two cook-offs paid for, and I need to finish the year out on. And he said, oh, that's fine, go ahead. Well, I'd won grand at the last two cook-offs on the pit and come home Saturday evening, unloaded everything, washed it all up good, and shammied it, took it over to the guy's house. And this guy's passed away now, but took it over and back in the shop. And I jumped out and talking to him. I said, well, I'm going to have to have a little more cash for this thing now, so it's got two more wins under its belt. <laughs> and this guy's wife... She went off and started cursing me like a sailor now. And I said, ma'am, ma'am, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not. And she just kept on. And her husband goes, honey, he's just kidding. He's just creating. And oh. then she really got mad because I said that. <laughs> it was just a joke. Then she was embarrassed. And then she really was fired up. Well, you, so, you the only reason was you missed the first part of that conversation when – when they were in the house and she started with, you bought a what for how much? <laughs> no, she was at the class. So she oh, okay. So she was on board. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she was there when the check was wrote. But, but when I told her I needed Wow, where money, do you find a wife like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's now Joe has that pit. He bought yeah. it from her after her husband passed away. So, um. So you're so Donnie Teal barbecue is your life. You work, uh, you have a, a carry out establishment there in Sperry. Um, and you work by yourself, don't you? Yeah. Other than from about a little after four in the evening until I close, if I don't run out of food and the wife gets home from her regular job, and she mm-hmm. comes up and helps me. And what do you cook on? What do you cook the food on it on the, uh, on the trailer, I can't. Is that a uh, is that it's an a, old hickory? It's old hickory, yeah. Old hickory, E L E D. Mm-hmm. And um, that's that's uh, a that's a big that's a huge cooker too. Matter of fact. Yeah, it 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 cooks some meat. Yeah, and um, you do the you do you cook all the sides, Donnie, and and get the barbecue ready and everything by yourself. Yeah, I do. I do everything. I just uh, I'm small, so. Most of the time, I've got to go pick everything up. Mm-hmm. I don't get anything delivered, so I get to cook it running in the mornings, and I'm running around going to different places to pick up whatever I need to pick up. And, yeah. And uh, did you ever have back. any? Did you when you first started? Did you try to have some help? No, no, uh, I didn't want to. Have, I'm one of them, and I'd rather do it. Because by the time you depend on help, they don't show up. And, mm-hmm. and uh, plus, if I want to close up shop, I don't need somebody to, depending on a paycheck. Yeah. That, you know, needs to work and I'm closing and headed to a barbecue contest or 
or you know going to go catch a couple contests in two weeks and be gone for a week and, yeah so yeah you can, you can do what you want and, and I, I tell you what as a small business owner i admire that because uh, there's been many times when um when I've been getting ready to go to a comp on a Friday and I wanted to leave at 12, something comes up and you, you don't leave till 2.30 or 3 and then you go from having plenty of time to, uh, man, I hope I, I hope I have enough time. And it's a, it's a very, right. fru- it's a very frustrating, you know, feeling, but you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta take care of customers and you gotta take care of people and you, and you, and it just yeah. falls under the header. You do what you gotta do. What, um, so you're about what now? 50 years old? Uh, 53, 53. What's the future hold for Donnie Teal? I mean, you're a young man and you got, you got plenty of, uh, competition years. I mean, gosh, you've got plenty of competition years left. Are you going to, uh, and I know, you know, I know you just, you had one last weekend. I think you finished what 11th and it was out of like 65 teams, a huge contest. How did that go? By the way, did everything run smoothly? I mean, yeah, they they did a good job. I mean, when you know, at turn in, you had to wear a mask and mm-hmm. and uh, wipe your boxes down. Yeah. And, and uh, but yeah, everything went real well. I was kind of skeptical, not on anybody's part, other than my thing was is all these businesses just got to reopen. Now you're closing off their main street on a Friday and a Saturday. And these people, Oh yeah. You're, they can't make any money to speak of. And I thought that might be the sour great deal of the whole deal, but the business, I never heard anybody complain Good. Yeah, that I, that I know of. So, yeah. Um, did you ever cook any, uh, MBN in Memphis and May? I've never have. I've been to one or two and, yeah, you know they got them joint ones now with KCBS, and, but I've been to Memphis and May once and watched that. And just mm-hmm. kind of walked around. I've always wanted to go and hang out in somebody's yeah. camp, and do dishes or something, and just kind of take it in. But yeah, I'm not a big enough BS or to do that as far <laughs> as the on-site deal. You know, he got he got they just announced he got called off today. I seen that. Yeah. Um, that's a shame too. That's a that I've never I've never been to one. I've only I cooked one one MBN event one time, and we didn't know what we were doing, and our scores uh, were exactly what we expected. <laughs> um, yeah. It was a good good thing for that brownie troop that we didn't finish last. <laughs> <laughs> um, what um what's what's the next contest this uh, coming up short term? Uh. My next one for me would be in Mayetta, Kansas. It'd be the weekend after the fourth. Mm-hmm. Cross our fingers, anyway. It's, it's still a go as of now, but yeah. never know what's going to happen with a, everything that's going on in the world. So, what about what about future competition? Are you gonna you just gonna keep keep you know doing it like you're doing it? Um, you, you're gonna change anything? Are you any plans to change anything at the uh, barbecue uh, establishment that you're running? I don't know. I'll keep everything pretty simple. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big change guy. If stuff's working, just keep on plugging away. So, Well, Donnie, I tell you what, I, you, you just thrilled me to death by talking with me this afternoon. And um, it's been a, been, you've been on my wish list for a very, very long time. I appreciate your, your courtesy and I appreciate your professionalism. And um, I wish you nothing but luck. And uh, I know who my nomination is going to be uh, for the next uh, Barbecue Hall of Fame uh, when it when it comes time to start the nominations because uh, somebody like yourself who has uh, literally been in barbecue all his adult life and has has uh, given back to the barbecue community through serving on the board, philanthropy, uh, information uh, certainly deserves uh, to be. On the in the Hall of Fame, but really deserves to at least have a nomination. And uh, I know I'm going to try to do everything I can to get you on that list, because, sir, I'm going to tell you something, Donna. You deserve it. And uh, I think there's a whole lot of people out there that probably agree with me. Well, I appreciate that. I really do. So, well, maybe our uh, paths will cross someday at a competition. I sure hope so. And um, oh yeah, 
and maybe we'll sit back on um, Friday night. We can open up that uh, bottle of bourbon and put on some, uh, put on the, uh, uh, put on a John Prine album. Let me ask you one one question: If you could only listen to one John Prine album for the rest of your life, which one would it be? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of good ones. I, I mainly anymore. I just listen to, you know, Spotify yeah. or Pandora. So, yeah. Uh, but my favorite, one of my favorites is 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 uh, the wedding song. So, yep. What I call the wedding song. But, that, that's the duets album. Yeah, with. Airs to bent. Yep. Well, mine yeah. is mine is sweet Man, revenge. All, mine is mine is with uh, Mac Wiseman too. Uh huh. Mine's Those sweet revenge. Like That's the one I would yeah. I couldn't I couldn't live without. This is his uh his second album. That's my it's my all time favorite. Yeah, I mean just the Corona got him. So. Well, they said that's what it was, but I don't know if you saw him, Donna. He was in pretty bad condition. Bless his heart. He'd been sick. Yeah, with, I, I was on the. David Qualls because he books the entertainment for the one of the casinos here in Oklahoma, and I was always on him about trying to get John. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he said after he won them Grammys, his price yeah. was really elevated. He, yeah. said he didn't think he could get him, you know, before they could make any money off the deal. When you start winning Grammys and they start putting you on the the CBS Sunday Morning News, your stock goes up pretty good. Yeah, that's that's the Ray Lampy deal there. Yeah, <laughs> you know the. <laughs> I hope somebody sends him a copy of this. He'll get a kick out of that. He's a he's a good one, that's for sure. Donnie, thank you so much. I appreciate you. you. Bet. Let's stay in touch, okay? All right, we'll do. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you, Donnie Teal, everybody from Sperry, Oklahoma. If you ever in Sperry, Oklahoma, and you get a chance to go by the uh, donut D- delight donuts, uh, the barbecue trailer right out in front is um, Donnie Teal, and uh, you won't you will not be disappointed. I know when David Bosca's son uh, Levi started the uh, butcher barbecue uh, barbecue stand in uh, Chandler, Oklahoma, uh, they went to uh, Donnie's place to get some advice and to eat some food and. Uh, and I know Levi was very impressed. You can hear you can hear David's interview with Donnie on Spotify on podcast. Uh, it's it's great. It's a great interview. David David does a good job. Everybody, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Don't forget, we're brought to you by Michelin Tires. The best thing you can do is ride on Michelin Tires for your car and your family. Don't accept anything less. We're also brought to you by Butcher Barbecue. And all the products from the Butcher Barbecue family, David Bosca does a great job of innovation, taste, and making sure that we all have what we need for our barbecue in the backyard and in competition. Of course, also Green Mountain Grills bring you this part of the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show. Green Mountain Grills, a pellet smoker, easy to use, dependable. You don't have to worry about if it's going to work. Or not, it works, I assure you. You can see those at my place, the Owl's Nest Barbecue Store in Ottawa. Uh, stay with us next uh, next Thursday. We're going to have another show for you. I'm not sure who we're going to have on yet. We're working on it. But uh, I, I, I assure you, that'll be somebody that you will enjoy, just like I do. Everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Donnie Teal. And until next Thursday night, everyone, good night and good luck. She don't like her eggs all runny. She thinks crossing her legs is funny. She looks down her nose at money. She gets it on like the Easter bunny. She's my baby, I'm her honey. I'm never gonna let her go. She ain't got laid in a month of Sundays. Caught him once and he was sniffing my undies. He ain't too sharp, but he gets things done. Drinks his beer like it's oxygen. He's my baby, and I'm his honey. Never gonna let him go. It's
everybody by herself will end up sitting on a rainbow against all odds honey we're the big door prize we're gonna spike our noses right off of our faces there won't be nothing but big old hearts dancing in our eyes